The first two episodes of season three of The Mandalorian, uh, not great, to put it lightly. But now, after a third episode that's even longer, with more story being presented, we surely are on the right track now, right? We surely have a grasp on where things are going with this property. It's the worst episode to date. Show of hands, class, who watched Andor? It was a pretty solid Star Wars show. Had some interesting characters. It was slower moving, but it actually laid out a solid framework for episodes to come down the road. That's not what's happening with Mandalorian. I bring up Andor because this felt like a crappy cosplay of that show. We had 10 minutes of what we were familiar with, but then this thing goes way off the rails. Next thing you know, we're in Coruscant with some boring ass henchmen for the next 40 minutes. It's, it's awful, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Let's break this down. This is going to be a spoiler breakdown video. I, I'm doing this every week when the show comes out and I have time to record my thoughts. We break down the episode, the pros and the cons. This one's going to be mostly cons. Although I will say the first 10 minutes, pretty solid here. Pretty good stuff. We see Bo-Katan pull Mandalorian again out of that water. That was a little deeper than he thought. He was, he was hoping to go down maybe ankle level, but instead plunged to his death. Unless she would have saved him, of course. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a mess. He's, he's made some mistakes. So here we see them taking stock of what just occurred. He's kind of wringing out his t-shirt. Not really, but you know, he's dusting himself off. Doesn't thank her, I noticed. Didn't thank her for saving him. Kind of a baller move, very alpha male. Then they get in the plane and take off back home, but on the way, they're ambushed by a series of warlords, I think? She makes a really quick note about it. She's like, oh yeah, these guys are mad, we stole a vehicle. It doesn't matter. We have some action, let's take it in. They're in trouble right now. They're in one plane, flying against like seven to 10. So what they're gonna have to do here is of course a transfer maneuver. That's something they're familiar with and we're not, but we're gonna soon find out what that means. As Mando just straight up drops out of the plane in a free fall. There's TIE Fighter 2.0s flying past him. And right before he hits the ground, right before he splats into the pavement, he hits the juice on the boosters. <laughs> how long I presented that is about how long he does it for. I am not a scientist. I know very little about physics or about speed to weight ratios, things of that nature. But I feel like someone that free falls out of a plane, but then at the last second hits thrusters on his jetpack is going to be worse off than if you would have just hit the ground. I mean, you're falling really fast and then suddenly you hit these things which has to bring you to a complete stop already. So wouldn't you just like, I mean, you'd have such bad whiplash, your neck would break. But he just was like <laughs> and he goes down. I don't care, sci-fi logic, we'll throw it away. It was a cool scene. It's the last cool scene in this episode. <laughs> So after a solid introduction, the writers remind us that they have absolutely no idea what they're doing with this show. Title kicks in, and now we're back at Coruscant from the good old prequel films. I'm sure glad I get to be reminded of that constantly now. We're going to spend almost the remainder of this episode on this new character, Dr. Penn Pershing. He sucks. Pershing used to be a henchman for Moth Gideon, and has since been recruited into the New Republic, I think is what it's called where they're kind of rehabilitating these people that were once on the wrong side of the tracks. They dust them off, they clean them, give them a nice place to live, have them do a psych eval every day with a droid. It's a nice little thing. It's a nice meal ticket. His job's not great though. It's unfulfilling. He's cataloging old remnants of the empire, something. It doesn't matter. What he really wants to do is clone. The guy lives cloning, he breathes cloning, it's all he wants. And he feels like even though his research before was for a bad guy, that doesn't mean he can't use it for good. Now, the New Republic says nay, but he's gonna find a way. Life finds a way, as Malcolm tells us from Jurassic Park. I don't know why that's relevant in any stretch of the imagination, but let's just keep going. He meets up about halfway through this show with another crew member from Moth Gideon's crew. What are the odds? Well, anyone that's watched more than two hours of television knows this person's not to be trusted. 
not to be trifled with. There's something off about female Mario Lopez here that I don't quite trust. My wife came up with that. She thought that right away. She's like, man, this woman looks like Mario Lopez. Jawline, bone structure and all. I'm like, yeah, she looks like she could bench me. I'm kind of scared of her and slightly aroused, but Mario Lopez is a good looking guy. Let's keep going. Her name is Ellie Kang and she's hell bent on helping old Pershing make his dreams a reality. And to do so, they're going to have to hatch a plan. It's going to have to be tightly orchestrated. And basically, it just consists of them tricking someone to get on a train, and then they jump off. It's brilliant. I've talked about this several times on this channel. It's come up a lot more lately because Disney's really going all in on green screen tech. It's a newer green screen tech, though, that's worse, with digital backgrounds, and the people just kind of walk in place, and they move things around them. It looks awful. It really looks bad. They're not even trying. They're not even putting effort into making these people seem like they're part of the scene that they're in. For instance, Pershing and female Mario Lopez are walking outside during like a Coruscant carnival or some shit. And they're just clearly walking in place. Lights are going off in the background. There's all sorts of festivities. But the lights on them are not changing at all. No reflection, no shadows coming and going, just straight light hitting them. Not, not a care in the world. During the train jump I mentioned later, this train, by the way, is going like 100 some miles an hour. These two dumbasses jump off the back unscathed. No bruise, nothing. And the jump is just horrific. They jump off of this thing and it's like the animation department was like, oh crap, we don't actually have a shot of them hitting the ground because they just jumped in front of a green screen. So they like froze them in place for a couple frames and they just kind of plopped them over. It's like, Whoop! so they get the cloning equipment they need from an old Star Destroyer or something. I can't be bothered to look what this thing's called. As they're about to leave, though, security shows up and bam, Pershing is under arrest. But not female Mario Lopez because she's working for him. What? We trusted you said no one watching. She's either working for Moth Gideon or maybe this is a First Order situation from the sequel Star Wars movies that most people don't like either. I can't wait to get to that point. Things do not end well for Pershing. His mind is flayed, I think is the term. She convinces the security guard to let her stay and watch and that's when she really turns the heat up. Bing! And his goose is cooked. We then seamlessly jump back to Mando and friends. What is going on with the writing on these shows now? This happened in Boba Fett too, the book of Boba Fett. Suddenly we're in a Mandalorian episode with no hint to it at all. Like no setup. It's just boom, Mandalorian episode. Bam, now back to Boba Fett. That's what happened here. They didn't play into the storyline. So it's just Mandalorian storyline and or cosplay. No connective device at all. That is horrible. You don't present things that way. It, it, it's like it's like writing 101. I don't understand how this flies now. Anyway, we're back in the cave. There's the water right next to him again with the crocodile turtle thing that's like eight stories tall and can kill all these Mandalorian people. But maybe they killed the only one that was in there. Who knows? Who the hell knows? Uh, Bo-Katan is now a Mandalorian officially. So is Mando again. So is Din Djarin because he went into the pool. Even though he like fell to the bottom and she had to save him. There's so many loopholes with this society, with this cult. And again, why do they want to be part of this cult? It sucks. These people don't ever take off their armor or helmets, I guess, unless they're in super secret privacy to eat. How miserable. They barely have a conversation with each other. It's mostly this is the way or just a shoulder pat. So there's no like physical or human connection at all. Here's what Din Djarin gains by getting back in with these people. He never gets to take his helmet off. Oh wait, he already wasn't. So nothing there. Two, he gets to have no connection with people outside of baby Grogu, which, oh wait, he already didn't. Three, he gets to be a loner, a man of few words and less emotion. Chalk that up to Ben there doing that. He gains nothing by being back with this anti-Fast and the Furious family. It's stupid. The whole plot point is dumb. 
Let's get it out of here. And now Bo-Katan has to be part of it? I really hope that at some point she convinces him to how dumb this cult is. Because now we're three seasons deep. The Grogu storyline is basically done. It makes no sense now. He's just a tag-along merchandise sidekick. And now we have this Andor crap that's so boring and useless, I don't even want to watch the show. But I'm dedicated to bringing you the playbacks. So we're going to press on. Couple dishonorable mentions to bring up. We see a calamari in this episode. Remember those fish alien creatures? He says the thing. Whoa, it's a trap. It's a trap. And then he winks at the camera. Remember, we, we say that. That's what we say. This was the longest episode of the season and you could feel every single second go by. It was horribly paced. Just a grueling thing to get through. Several times I watched and thought to myself, why? Why am I doing this with my one time on planet Earth? And last but not least, the Mandalorian castle was destroyed. Bo-Katan's throne is gone. Where the hell is she going to sit 24-7? Now for a single honorable mention. That goes to Katie Sackoff, who plays Bo-Katan. She's so good in this. I mean, she's good in really everything I've seen her in. She just has screen presence. Something about her, that it factor, she's oozing with it. It's too bad she never really got bigger roles in movies or anything, but whatever. She's doing fine. She's doing well. Love her in this. She already has so much more interesting things going for her than Mandalorian does. We are three seasons in, and I don't give a shit about Din Djarin. I'd rather follow Bo-Katan. I don't know if it's because these writers over there don't know how to create new characters. They can only take ones that existed in the canon, in the prequels, in uh, the, the animated show. Because I know Bo-Katan's from there. That's what I'm told, at least. But Din Djarin has, like, nothing to his name. He was an orphan that was raised by the Mandalorians. He's no nonsense. He doesn't talk much. He's got a baby alien thing that he hangs out with. That's it. And he, for some reason, wants to get back in with the, the cult. She has so much more going for her, not only because she refuses to follow their bullshit trends, or at least up until this point, but also she just looks cool. She's a far better fighter. She has a lineage to her name and a bad blood history there. I mean, come on. Either make Din Djarin someone interesting or just spin off to Bo-Katan at this point. Give her Book of Bo-Katan. I'd rather watch that than schlubby Boba Fett for another season. And I think I got everything off of my breast that I wanted to. Let me know your thoughts on Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3. Like this video if you had some fun. Please subscribe if you want to hear me rant more about this series as it goes on. Maybe it'll get better. But as of right now, I'm kind of hate watching it. I went from two great seasons to almost instantaneously not liking the show, and that's mainly because how they treated the story, adding it into the book of Boba Fett, which was the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen a TV series do. Just full stop. I've never even heard of such a thing. Let's finish major cliffhanger plot points in a totally different show. It's brilliant, except for it's not. All right, thank you for watching. Take care, and hopefully i see you next time. Let's get the